morning, everyone. My name is Sue. On behalf of the Goochland branch of the Pamunkey Regional Library, welcome to today's program, Fall Planted Alliums. This presentation is part of the 2021 Horticultural Series, developed in a partnership between the Library and the Goochland Powhatan Master Gardener Association. Today's presenter is Audrey Hirsch. Audrey became a Master Gardener with the Goochland Powhatan Master Gardeners Association in 2019. She has been gardening for many years, mostly vegetables, but she also plants natives and perennials, keeps bees, and has an ornamental fish pond. Okay, let's get started. The chat feature will be available, so please send us our question, send us your questions. Here is Audrey Hirsch with Fall Planted Alliums. Hi everyone, thank you so much for joining today. Um, it's a solemn day, so I appreciate you, your attention. Um, I'm gonna talk today about alliums, and the reason that I really love alliums is because they're uh, both flowers and vegetables. I can't think of another family that has such beautiful, spectacular, prolific blooms as what you see on your screen, as well as uh, a number of really essential uh, core vegetables like garlic, onions, shallots, leeks, etc. cetera. So um, I got into alliums, you know, I started planting garlic a long time ago, and then I branched off into some other the alliums. And what, I love about them is that when everything else in the garden is finished, you go ahead and uh, clear out a spot and plant your garlic, plant your shallots, whatever you have, and then um, just kind of watch them. They start to sprout in February or so. And then around June, when everything else in the garden is done, you have the opportunity to harvest. Or I'm sorry, not when everything is done, but when everything is just starting to get going, you have the opportunity to harvest your garlic. And uh, it's, it's really fun. Um, so this picture comes from the Chelsea Garden Show in London, and I think it's pretty spectacular. So alliums are part of the Amaryllis family, which is a very large family. It's Amaryllis dice in, in Latin, but we don't need to go there. Uh, it, and what I like what, what I like about them is that they um, there's so many familiar bulbs that you know daffodils, lilies, crocuses, etc. Not tulips, notably. On the right hand side of the screen, you can see a picture of an of an allium. I think that's the Star of Persia. We'll talk about that one a little later. Um, their alliums don't taste good. None of the Amaryllis family taste good to critters. So pretty much they leave these flowers alone, which is a wonderful thing. So alliums are part of a subfamily of, of Amaryllidice called the Allioideae or Allium. Uh, also a large family, 700 different uh, bulbs. And you can see a characteristic Allium on the right side of the screen here. You can see these spear-like, lance-like leaves with a, a large bulb underneath and a big uh, globular uh, flower at the top. Allium is Latin for garlic. So that's an easy way to remember what we're talking about. Um, and they're in the genus of monocots. So I won't go too far into botany, but monocot just means that the first leaf that comes up is, you know, those cotyledons, they're the baby leaves. That's a single leaf as opposed to two leaves, which would make it a dicot. And trees are dicots. I don't need to go too far into this. So alliums are very, very hardy, easy care plants. They like fertile, well-drained soil, full sun. They don't like wet conditions that persist because they, uh, are, they can get fungal diseases if they're let in wet soil. They multiply via self-seeding. Most are bulbs or rhizomes. They don't need deep planting. They do need fertile conditions, as I mentioned. They benefit from thinning every few years. They bloom in the late spring, so starting around May and continuing all the way until July. So they bloom before irises and peonies, but um, after tulips, so along with the last tulips. After they flower, they die away, both the plant and the flower just fade away. 
So as I mentioned, you plant them in the fall, uh, after the first frost and before the hard freeze. Uh, you want to do it when it, the ground is still warm enough that the roots can get established, but before um, the hard freeze, um, and you want to do it so that the plant doesn't mistake the warm weather for spring and send up shoots because you want it to, to concentrate on the winter dormancy at that point. If you're burying them on the late side, it's good to water them at that time and also give them some mulch, and the mulch keeps the soil warm throughout the winter. Um, herbaceous alliums, and really the only herbaceous allium I can think of at this point is chives, uh, are a little bit different. They're, um, they're rhizomes and they're actually perennials. So a little bit about the planting depth of all alliums, and this pertains to ornamentals as well as edibles. We'll talk about edibles in a little bit here. Um, the bulb size really determines how deep you plant it. So you measure the bulb and if it's two inches long, then you plant it three times its, its, width, its depth, rather its length. So uh, six inches. So let me say that again, because I was a little confusing. So you measure the bulb, a two inch bulb would get planted six inches deep. So it's three times the height of the bulb is, is its planting depth. And you can space them three times their their length apart if you're planting in the ground. If they're going into a pot, they can actually be a little more uh, spaced a little closer together. So I'm just gonna briefly talk about some of the beautiful and spectacular allium plants that are available. These are obviously ornamental alliums. Um, a confession, I have not yet grown ornamental alliums. When I started this, when I started uh, researching alliums, I, I wrote an article on planting garlic for the Goochland Gazette. And when I was researching that article, I discovered this whole world of ornamental alliums. And so I decided uh, at that point that I needed to learn more about them. So in my research, I found some of these incredible and widely available alliums. Um, one thing about alliums is they're not widely available in the big box stores. You really have to order them online. And now is a perfect time to order alliums. Uh, the ornamentals are being shipped right now and the edibles will be shipped when it's closer to planting time. So what we're looking at here are three uh, of the largest, the Globemaster, the Gladiator, and the Gigantium. And when they say Gigantium, they're not kidding. The bulb, uh, I'm sorry, the flower on this is up to nine inches across. The Globemaster and the Gladiator are seven to eight inches across. So those are really big flowers. And they stand at three to four feet high. So they're really spectacular. And they look great if they're planted in a border as a backing to shorter neighbors, or you can mass them together as a real architectural statement. Or, you know, if you want to balance out a tree at one end of a, a bed or a shrub with alliums, they really look spectacular. At uh, Lewis Ginter, they mentioned that allium flowers have been called the Dr. Seuss of flowers because they have this outsized head on a very spindly stem. So I think that's really cute. On the right, we see the Allium spherocephalon, uh, the drumstick allium. This one does really well in central Virginia. One of our master gardeners actually grows a lot of these. So moving along, um, I showed this slide because I want to show the variety of colors. So on the left is Allium ceruleum, azureum, it's a blue. And, you know, like I said, they come in blue, pink, mauve, white, purple, many different shades. In the middle is Allium red mohican, and it's also got uh, little white flowerlets. I don't know if you can see them on the slide. Next is Allium Mount Everest, which is a really tall, really large Allium. And on the right is um, uh, Allium His Excellency, which is, from what I could see, the tallest of all. And I think it grows up to four to five feet tall with a giant bulb. So just to show a few more, um, Allium Janine up in the left corner is uh, also known as a lily leek. It's uh, yellow, as you can see, it's uh, shorter. And it does well in a woodland setting, so it prefers shade, which is pretty rare for alliums. Most alliums really like full sun. Next to it is a pink lily leak, which I think is really spectacular. The atro 
purpurium, sorry about that, is on the right. And that's that magenta colored. Look at how beautiful it is mixed with just regular uh, onion flowers. So that's just an onion in that picture up on the upper right. Down below, we have Allium caritaviense. And this is another one that does well in the shade. Surprisingly, it's a lower allium and it's got this beautiful pink bloom. And then on the right is the Star of Persia. Um, it's a very large allium. I think it's 10 inches in diameter and it, it, the color ranges from pink to purple. Included this slide in the handout for the presentation because I think it's really, really instructional. You can see not only when the alliums bloom, but also how tall they're going to get. And all the alliums that I mentioned in this presentation are in on this slide. What I noticed from looking at this graph is that the, the brighter ones seem to be clustered in the middle of the blooming time and the more subdued colors are over on the ends. And I don't know what the significance of that is really. Um, so, Alliums really are very great for pollinators. Pollinators love alliums, both edible and uh, ornamental. Uh, you can see butterflies, bees, parasitic wasps, other kinds of predator, predatory insects. Uh, on the left is the gladiator allium, which we looked at a minute ago. In the center is just a chive flower, just your regular run-of-the-mill chive, and on the right is an onion flower. So onion flowers, onions, are called Allium sepa. That's the Latin derivative for, or the Latin name. And I'm going to bring that up later when we're talking about edibles because it's, um, it's helpful to know what a true onion is. Just a few brief words about uh, Allium diseases. So um, alliums do well generally, but not when the weather is overly wet or when soil conditions are damp. When it's damp, they, um, oh, somebody is wanting to come in. Okay, when it's damp, uh, they tend to get a fungal infection and um, things like downy mildew, uh, leaf blight, bulb rot, et cetera. And that's the hardest thing for alliums. Um, I just read, I just saw today, I wasn't, didn't have time to read the article, but there was an article in today's Times Dispatch about what to do if your garden soil is too wet. I haven't had time to look at it, but it would be um, a remedy for, the, uh, for too wet conditions. So just a brief word about pests. Um, I won't make you look at the slide for too awfully long. Um, first of all, Rodents and deer tend to leave allium bulbs alone because they don't like the taste. The taste is, you know, garlic and onions. We can imagine what the raw bulb tastes like. And deer and most rodents don't really like the taste. They will go after shallots, unfortunately. Uh, and so it's good to use fencing or something like that around your shallots. Up on the left is the allium leaf miner. And the allium leaf miner is really um, uh, a, a pretty destructive pest. And I think it's um, it came to us from Europe and it really actually threatens the commercial onion crop at this point, so that's not great. Um, on the right, we have an onion thrip. Uh, and down at the bottom is the onion root maggot. And it turns into a maggot fly or a fly, which uh, devours the leaves and the stalks. So at this point, we're going to move on to edible alliums. Um, are there any questions so far? Don't forget, Don't forget, you can send your questions through the chat feature. Audrey would be glad to address them. So send them as you think of them. Okay. So no questions. So we'll just move on to the edible allium portion. So I, everything we covered so far pertains to um, ornamental alliums, but also edible alliums because they're very close. So edible alliums, we're talking about garlic, onions, shallots, leeks, chives, scallions, and ramps. So essentials of cuisine, you know, the, the basics. Um, and let's, let's just get right into it. So alliums, all alliums, whether they're ornamental or they're um, edible, have these characteristic spiky leaves up on the top is an allium, uh, it's an onion flower, allium sepa, and down at the bottom is a leek. And so they look different and yet they, they share similarities. They all have that distinctive 
pungent aroma when they're crushed. They all have these big pom-pom like flowers. Pollinators just really love them. So around the world, alliums are a foundation of cuisine. You know, in every single culture, onions and garlic are, are widely used. And then there's others as well, like leeks and shallots and chives, etc. Cooking alliums, you know, we're, we're going to talk about the organosulfur compounds in just a minute. Cooking alliums releases the sugars that are found in the bulbs and it diminishes that pungent aroma and the pungent taste of the bulbs. Let's move along. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about the organosulfur compounds. You know, when we think of uh, onions and garlic, you really think about that pungent aroma, that bad smell. So that comes from organosulfur compounds. And those compounds are absorbed from the soil. Um, and it's, they're there to be a, a, a deterrent to all kinds of predators, you know, whether it's human predators or deer, rodents, et cetera. And, you know, nobody likes that raw taste of them, except for maybe humans. Um, but what happens when you cook it, as I mentioned, is that those sugars in the sulfur compounds uh, overwhelm the pungency. And so we get a really uh, lovely compound to, to grow or to eat. So when, when we eat these compounds, those substances, those organosulfur compounds are absorbed into our bloodstream and are emitted through the pores and through the breath. And we know about that already. We know that, you know, eating onions and garlic is, is hard on your breath. But nonetheless, they are really healthy things. Organosulfur compounds uh, have lots of health benefits. And some of the most significant ones are that they have chemopreventative properties and antioxidants. As a matter of fact, leeks are, are believed to have a phytochemical called camphorol, which is believed to help prevent cancer. Uh, oh, one last thing about the um, sugars in the bulb. The sugars that are stored in the bulb are actually stored energy for the plant. So that when the plant create, uh, live, creates a flower, um, it's, it draws on the energy that's in the bulb in order to create seeds and fruit. So speaking of seeds and fruit, uh, we're looking here at a garlic plant and you can see that it's, it's forming a blossom. And so that's what I'm talking about. This, you know, the, the bulb will, will release its energy into the plant so that the flowers can open and uh, create seeds and it's using that energy. Alliums don't have big spreading leaves and so they can't shade the ground. So they do require some mulch in order to uh, deter pests, shade the soil, keep down the heat. Um, if you, lots of weeds, reduces uh, onion yields, garlic yields, et cetera, and encourages insect pests to prey upon the, the alliums. When they're close to harvest, they really benefit from some very uh, strenuous weeding and also good mulching. And that allows fresh air to come in to the soil and allows the bulbs to start to dry down rather than get fungal diseases from wet conditions. So when I'm talking about mulches, really what I'm talking about are um, uh, straw and leaf mulch. Now I would imagine that ornamental alliums, uh, you could use wood mulch, but I wouldn't recommend using wood mulch in the edible garden. Um, so, you pretty much, after you plant these alliums in the fall, you pretty much leave the plot alone until February. Uh, and then you start doing some light weeding and maybe reapplying your mulch and then continuous weeding up until um, a harvest time in June or um, after the allium blooms and the plant dies away. So, now specifically, I'm going to talk about garlic, but one of the th some of the things I want to talk about with garlic are pertinent to all of the alliums. So if we look at this picture, this actually comes from my garden, and there's a few things to look at here. One, uh, I, it's probably taken in May or maybe in June, and you can see that there's some weeds coming up, so I really should have been more uh, um, attentive to my weeding. Additionally, um, the mulch is getting a little sparse. I needed to add some more mulch there. But if you notice the leaves, a couple things. One thing, the leaves are very narrow. They're not shading the ground. So it's allowing weeds to come up. 
Another thing, the leaves are kind of turning brown and they look like they're, they're drying out. And normally you'd say, oh my goodness, my plant is, is dying, what's happening here? But this is actually the normal lifespan of the plant. And what it's telling us is that we've stopped bulb formation and we're starting to have um, drying out of the bulb and it's almost ready for harvest. So um, you'll harvest these when about 50% of the leaves have this dried out looking condition. So it's a little early for harvest at this point but it's nice of the plant to tell you when it's getting ready for harvest. So um, again, this pertains to all alliums, not just garlic, but um, you, here in central Virginia, we plant in the fall and depending on temperatures, we plant between mid October to sometime in November. You know, if it's an especially warm year, we can uh, delay that and go all the way up into December. Alliums do have a necessary period of dormancy in the winter time. They should be planted in the fall before the first frost, and or I'm sorry, after the first frost and before that really hard freeze. Um, garlic bulb formation. So this is very interesting. The start of garlic bulb formation and onion bulb formation and leaf formation in all alliums is really triggered by daylight. So we celebrate the um, spring equinox in on March 21st, and then the summer solstice is on June 15th. I'm sorry, June 21st. Summer solstice, we have 15 hours of daylight. Spring equinox, we have 12 hours of daylight. Bulb formation is triggered by 13 hours of daylight. So we have a narrow window in there between March 21st and June 21st when bulb formation really takes place. Bulb formation stops when the temperature reaches about 91 degrees consistently. So it's like I said, it's a narrow window, but you know at the end of June when the temperatures start to spike here in central Virginia, it's really time to pull out your onions, garlic leeks, etc. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about um, scapes, uh, which are buds. Um, as I mentioned, daylight and heat triggers bulb formation, but also it triggers flowers. And as I mentioned, garlic, onions, all of them have flowers. You don't want the flowers to bloom because then the bulb is putting its energy, that stored sugar in the bulb, it's putting its energy into the flower rather than bulb formation. And really what we're trying to encourage is really good bulb formation. So these scapes, when you see them come up, you just chop them up. What the beautiful thing about garlic scapes is that they're very edible. You chop them up, saute them in whatever you're cooking, and they appear just at the time that last year's garlic is gone. So you don't have any more homegrown garlic to use. You can use these scapes. They're very delicious. They taste like a mild garlic. And so here's another picture of my, uh, my garlic patch. And as I mentioned, those leaves are starting to turn brown. I think it's the same picture. So we'll just, um, we'll just run right by this. So let's talk about harvesting garlic. And this pertains to harvesting almost all of the alliums. Um, garlic is ready when half of the leaves have turned brown and are laying over, like I showed in that picture. Uh, you want to be careful when you're going to uh, harvest the alliums because the bulbs can get punctured. So it's great to use a digging fork, go out about three inches from the stalk, gently loosen the soil, and then just kind of pick up the garlic in your hand. It's gonna be dirty, don't worry about that. Um, you have to cure garlic, you have to cure onions, you have to cure pretty much all of them. So as the bulb dries out, uh, the, the dirt dries out as well, and it's very easy to just brush it off. So rather than getting it wet, uh, just let the dirt dry. You don't want to get it wet because that in introduces moisture and that's how these bulbs rot earlier if they get wet. You want them to cure. And so speaking of curing, let's talk about that. Uh, so once you've harvested your garlic, your onions, your leeks, etc., you want to put them in a, a dry shaded place for approximately a week and then come back trim off about five inches of the stalk, trim off some of the root, leave them alone for another week, come back, uh, 
trim off some more, take off the remaining root hairs, and then put them in a, a warm, uh, actually not warm, a moderate temperature dry place for as long as you like, as long as the humidity is low. And this pertains to pretty much all alliums. But I do wanna mention something else about this picture. This is uh, a part of my harvest of hard neck garlic this year. So there are two kinds of garlic primarily. There's hard neck and there's soft neck. And then there's also a giant garlic, but that's not a true garlic, that's actually a leek, which I didn't know until I started researching this. So I'm only gonna talk about hard neck and soft neck. This is a picture of hard neck garlic. Hard neck just means that the stalk is hard. Soft neck garlic means the stalk, the stalk is soft. So soft neck garlic is what we typically find in the grocery store. Uh, it stores very well. It doesn't have as pungent a flavor and it's braidable. Uh, so you can braid those stalks rather than trimming them off. And I've braided my soft neck in the past. They're really attractive and you, you know, you hang them in the pantry and it feels good to walk in and see your, your braided garlics uh, in your pantry. But hard neck garlic, uh, you can't braid. It's hard. The stalk is very stiff. So this is the one that you really trim off the way I mentioned before. So I'll pause here. Are there any questions? Okay, I'll keep going. So let's talk about onions. Onion, uh, Allium sepa. As uh, sorry, uh, Audrey, I do yes. have a question. Sorry to, to interrupt. Um, I was trying to type it and I'm not that quick. Um, when you were talking about, you said you would cure them outside as opposed to say curing them in the garage or something. Um, what are your thoughts? So I cure them in a woodshed that I have. It's a three-sided building and it's shaded. Uh, that's the key. Um, it, it has to, you know, it needs to be warm so they dry out, but it has to be shaded away from the sun because that will dry them out too quickly. I would imagine a garage would be fine. Um, any, any place where they're dark, warm, and have the opportunity to dry out. Is there any problem with them being overheated or if they're stored in a garage or something? Is that an issue? I don't really know. I would imagine that if the temperatures are, you know, just really soaring, uh, that it could affect the, uh, the bulb might rot a little quicker or might dry out a little quicker than they normally would. So I, I would imagine that uh, temperature would have an effect. Let me, let me look into this a little bit. Um, so the storage is between um, 30 to 60 degrees. So I would imagine that when you're originally trying to dry them out, you wouldn't want it to get much above 100 degrees if you can help it. That's just a guess on my part. So Allium sepa, um, which are the common onion. Let's talk about that one. So um, just like with uh, garlic, they need fertile, well-drained, loose soil. You don't want those damp conditions to cause fungal infections. Uh, and they benefit from the addition of compost and mulch. Uh, onions do like to have um, about four inches of soil. So you, if you're planting them in rows, you want to hill them up. Or if you're planting them in a raised bed, that's ideal. But the addition of compost and mulch is uh, really necessary. And that's true for almost all alliums. I can think that leeks also like that uh, hilling up of, of the flower, of the bulbs. So talking about onion sets versus onion seeds. When I first started with this, I, I had no idea what an onion set was. And all an onion set is, is a, a bulb that's grown specifically for gardening. Um, and you plant onion sets at the same time that you plant garlic, leeks, et cetera, in the fall, or you can plant them in the spring. And one thing to know is that if you're planting them in the spring, you're not gonna get as big an onion as you might get if you're planting them in the fall and then harvesting in June. Um, and that's where we get that spring onion. And we'll talk about spring onions in detail in just a moment. So seeds, onion seeds, you can start onions from seeds and I didn't really know that either. Uh, onion seeds need to be started inside along the same time as peppers and tomatoes. Uh, and you grow them just exactly the same as uh, peppers and tomatoes. Um, again, they won't reach the size of a fall planted onion 
because they won't have as long a time uh, for bulb uh, development. So they need at least four to six weeks of warm temperatures when you're planting them in the fall. So it's necessary to find that sweet spot of um, after the first frost and before the hard freeze so that they can establish strong roots. And it's the same for garlic, it's the same for all of the fall planted alliums. Um, April, if you're planting in the spring, this is uh, interesting to know. If you're planting them in the spring, they need to be planted when the current consistent temperature is above 28 degrees. So here that's usually around March. You can extend it to April, but um, you can't go much beyond that because they really need that extended growing period for uh, bulb development. Again, I prefer fall planting and that's just a preference on my part because you know it's like a present. You know, you, you get back out in the garden when nothing else is happening, plant some things, leave them alone. And then suddenly in June when nothing else much is being harvested, you get the gift of your fall alliums. So I really like that. This slide, I really like this slide. And I've put this into the handout because I think it's a really good illustrative um, graphic of uh, bulb development. So um, you can see that on the left side you have the establishment, you have your first two leaves coming up and that occurs usually here if it's a fall planted allium, that occurs usually around March. And then we go through the vegetative growth uh, stage to bulb initiation. And remember I said that bulb initiation re requires 13 hours of daylight. So um, around what did I say? Between, so May, June is when we really start getting bulb initiation. And then you continue with bulb development until we get those consistent hot temperatures. And that's the end of bulb development. Then the plant falls over and is beginning to tell you that it's time for harvest. Something that's interesting when you look at this graph, uh, this graphic rather, you can see the, the bulbs poking up above the ground and onions do this, leeks do this, shallots do this, but garlic does not. So in this, I'm showing you an onion flower. They're really beautiful. They're very attractive to uh, pollinators, but you don't want them to, to develop because once the, as I've mentioned, once the flower shows, then the, the plant is really not putting much energy into bulb development. Instead, it's putting its energy into the flower and into seeds or the fruits of the onion. So you're not gonna get as big an onion if you see these flowers. One, I don't know, you know, I, I mentioned garlic scapes. I don't know about onion scapes, if they're edible and if the onion flower is edible. So um, I, I don't know the answer to that. So to harvest onions, um, like I said, the, the plant bends over. It's very helpful in that sense. Um, and you go down and you squeeze the stalk. And if the stalk feels crunchy and soft, not hard and, and it doesn't look green, then you know it's getting ready to be harvested. If it's still green, or if it, it doesn't feel soft when you squeeze on it, uh, you leave it for another week or two and come back uh, after that and squeeze it again. However, if, it's, if the weather forecast says it's gonna rain a lot, you wanna go out and get those bulbs because uh, otherwise they, are, they might start to rot. And the curing is very similar to garlic. You wanna cure it in partial shade for two to three weeks until the next have thoroughly dried, and then you're gonna clip the tops to within one inch of the bulb. So now we're gonna move on to shallots. I love growing shallots. I think it's, it's so fun because, um, I don't know why, I just really love growing shallots. But you can see that shallots have a little bit of an identity problem going on here. You can see three different names of shallots. And um, so biologists have finally settled on Allium sepa. Remember, that's the common onion, variety aggregatum. So aggregatum, this is a common onion. Aggregatum means joining a flock in Latin. I looked it up. And so that's very interesting because if you look at the picture on the right, you can see that um, a shallot is a, is is a grouping of onions. It's, they're called multiplier onions for that reason, bunching onions. 
um, they multiply in the ground. They, each bulb has its own set of layers, just like an onion does, but they, they don't taste like onions. They have a much more subtle uh, uh, flavor and they can readily be used in recipes instead of onions or in addition to onions. Um, it's a much more delicate flavor. They're easy to grow, but they're pretty expensive in the grocery store. So I strongly advise growing some shallots on your own. Um, I usually, oh, shallots are, are ready to uh, harvest in about three to six months after planting. Or if you do that winter dormancy thing, they'll, they'll be dormant for the winter. And then once they start developing uh, leaves, it's three to six months. Now, I usually grow French gray shallots. What I'm showing here is actually from my garden and they're not French gray. I don't know the, the variety. Um, French gray shallots are a little bit bigger than these and they're the true shallot. You, you see them quite often in the grocery store. A nice mild flavor, and, but they don't, uh, they're bigger than these shallots that you see on the right. Um, and there's not as many of them. There's usually only two or three in a bunch. Just like with other alliums, you don't want the, the shallot to develop a flower. Uh, you wanna knock it off before it develops a flower. So to cure, very similar to um, everything else that we've been talking about, cure it in a warm, dry location, uh, place the bulbs in, oh, well, this one says to place the bulbs in a mesh bag. I haven't done that. I've just kind of separated them from the rest of my garlic and my onions. Um, but they're drying in the same location. Relatively low humidity if you can help it in order to forestall rot. So folks haven't generally eaten shallots, so I've included a recipe here because um, I think it really shows how wonderful shallots are. This recipe appeared in the New York Times in 2020, and it was their most downloaded recipe of that year. And um, caramelized shallot pasta. So you, you just cook shallots until they get really soft and caramely and very sweet. Remember I talked about uh, releasing the sugars and you really can tell that when you caramelize either onions or garlic or shallots, they get very sweet. This pasta dish has a surprise ingredient and that is anchovies. And surprisingly, I don't like anchovies, but the anchovies just kind of melt away in this recipe and they add really delicious flavor. You don't even taste them. It doesn't taste fishy at all. So I really strongly advise you to go ahead and try this recipe and I've included it in the deck. But as I said, it's in your um, handout as well. Now let's briefly talk about chives. Chives are a little bit different from the rest of the alliums I've been talking about because they're a perennial. Um, they're very cold tolerant. Um, they need full sun, rich, moist soil, not, or, I'm sorry, not moist soil. They don't like it too dry, uh, too moist, just like all alliums. Um, this one, you can let develop a flower. It doesn't ruin the bulb because you're not eating the bulb. You're eating the, the grass, you know, the leaves. And you just clip the leaves as you need them for uh, recipes. And as a matter of fact, you need to do that in order for the um, plant to develop new leaves and continue to, to provide you with food. So one thing about these is they, you can put them in pots, you can put them in the perennial garden, you can uh, put them around your ornamental alliums to discourage pests, and you can put them in the vegetable garden for that same reason. They're very shallow rooted and they self seed. So they're kind of ideal. So finally we get to leeks. And leeks are a little bit different from others. Um, leeks are considered a root vegetable, but they're not really a root. They're easy to grow. They don't form a bulb. Uh, the edible part is the bottom six inches or so of the cylindrical stalk that you see here. Um, and that part turns white and the whiter it gets, the closer to harvest you know it is. The plant gets kind of uh, flattened, it flattens a bit and the leaves, leaves start to droop, but they don't fall over the way onions and garlic do. Um, after a fairly long growing period, it takes four to five months to develop leeks. They can be harvested 
And uh, you don't cure them the same way that you cure onions and garlic and shallots. Um, as a matter of fact, they, um, they don't keep, you can't cure them. So it's good to plant successive um, plantings of leeks because they'll keep in the refrigerator for approximately one month. Um, so if you, you plant them successively, then you'll have a supply of leeks uh, throughout the growing season. But as I say, they take four to five months for them to mature. So you have to plan ahead. They have shallow roots and um, they require plentiful water, but uh, they don't like overly moist conditions. I think I talked a little bit about this. Okay, so let's talk about harvest. So when you're harvesting them, um, you, you will need at least a three inch white section and it feels firm and solid when you palpate it. Uh, you can pull the whole leek plant and it can be pulled anytime they're about as big around as your thumb. Uh, if the soil is really compacted, you wanna get out your digging fork again. And because they don't form a bulb, it's not as critical to, to go out three inches from the plant because they go straight down. They don't have that big bulb. You're gonna to wanna to trim the tops. They're not edible because you know, they're very fibrous and tough. The usable portion is that white section. Cut it up and it's very good in um, casseroles or soups or lots of things. I haven't really cooked much with leeks, um, but I, they're a very pleasant and mild aromatic flavor. So now we're gonna move on to scallions. So scallions are, a little bit different. They're called bunching onions as well, green onions, spring onions, Welsh onions, long green onions. They don't form a bulb. They're called, in Latin, they're called allium fistulosum. Fistulosum in Latin means hollow. So that tells you that the stem of a scallion is hollow. And we're gonna differentiate scallions from onions, uh, allium sepa. Remember allium sepa is our, our true onion in that these don't develop a bulb and they're hollow. Um, these, these are also perennials. They'll continue to come back. They do need to be divided periodically. And uh, what's great about them is you can eat almost the entire plant as, as is evident in this slide. You don't wanna eat those hairy, uh, rooty ends and you don't wanna eat the very tip top of the green because it's very fibrous and hard to digest. Um, you trim, you can, pull the whole plant and eat all of it, or you can just trim up a portion and it will regrow. They do need to be divided periodically to keep them coming. And you can plant them in successive planting so you'll have a continuous supply um, all summer long. So um, now we're gonna talk about green onions, which you commonly see in the stores, sold as scallions. And I'm just here to tell you, these are not scallions, these are onions, Allium sepa. So you can look down at the end of this uh, plant and you can see that it's got a, a little bit of a bulb coming. So these are just immature onions uh, that do form bulbs and you're going to harvest them uh, before the, the, they really develop a true bulb. So when it becomes a little bit swollen and oblong, you harvest it. You, again, you can eat pretty much all of this plant, but you're probably not gonna wanna eat the very tip tops of the green ends because it's fibrous again. Um, and let's contrast this with the spring onion, also Allium sepa. You can see that the, the bulb has gotten bigger here. Uh, these are spring planted onions. They're not gonna be as large as your, you know, well-known potato onions that we see in the markets all the time. They're all Allium sepa. Um, again, you can eat almost all of this, but you're not gonna wanna eat the green tough edges because they're very difficult to digest. So in this slide, I've, I've just shown all three. Um, you have uh, spring onions on the left, you have green onions on, in the middle, and over on the end, you have scallions, Allium fistulosum. So you can see the differences between them. The scallions really don't have a bulb, but spring onions and green onions do, and they are true onions. So finally, we get to ramps. So ramps are um, a spring delicacy. 
They are uh, wild, also known as wild leeks. They're a native perennial that grow up in our mountainous regions of Virginia, West Virginia. Um, they have a very distinctive flavor somewhere between an onion and garlic, but they're very mild. Um, and they're a gourmet food, if you will. You In the springtime, you find them in on restaurant menus quite uh, frequently. They're expensive. Um, and they're harvested, uh, if, if you come upon a patch like this in the mountains, then you're quite lucky uh, because they're, they're rare and they're hard to find. And the optimal way to harvest a ramp is just to take one or two of these leaves. Uh, these ramps actually look like they're a little bit old. Um, you want them when they're a little bit less fibrous, less developed. The key to harvesting a ramp is um, after the snow melts and before the leaves come out on the on the trees, that's the sweet spot for ramps. Once the leaves come out, then the flowers will um, the flowers will develop and the ramps are no longer as edible. The edible portion of a ramp is that stalky end and the leaves. Uh, you can see how they look when they're growing in the ground on that bottom um, picture. Um, the, they start from one bulb and then they'll spread out and colonize over time, which is that first picture that we saw. And uh, they, they just grow six to eight leaves at a time and they're about three inches wide. Um, and the, the foliage and the, and the bulbs are the edible part of the plant. And they've got to be harvested before the leaves come out and before the plant goes dormant. Once the, the leaves go dormant, they have this flower, the flower is not edible. So harvesting ramps, um, this picture is really, I think, a great description of how to harvest a ramp. If you pull the bulb of a ramp, you've destroyed that plant. Here's the thing about ramps. They take seven to 10 years to grow back. So once you pull that bulb, that's it for that plant. And it will take the, the mother plant seven to 10 years to replace it. So the question here is, you know, how do you sustainably harvest them? Well, the answer is, you know, just take one or two of the leaves. You don't want to take all of the leaves because then the plant has no leaves left to photosynthesize and create more energy for the plant so that it will come back the next year. Unfortunately, a lot of our native ramp species are going extinct because of over harvesting and unsustainable harvesting. So there's that. So are ramps cultivable? cultivatable? Well, the, the answer is maybe. Um, I know there's at least one market gardener on this presentation. And so, you know, the question is, would a market gardener want to devote a section of their garden to a plant that's going to take seven to 10 years before it's harvestable? Eh, you know, they do, folks do grow asparagus. Asparagus takes a good five years before it's routinely harvestable. So the, the answer is maybe, and maybe with uh, science, we'll get some, some better results and we'll be able to um, have some cultivable, cultivable ramps. So just for grins, I put another recipe into your, uh, your handout. This is ramps and pasta. And you can, I haven't tried this, but it looks delicious. Um, and in, if you didn't have ramps, you could use scallions, you could use leeks, you could use shallots, you could use garlic, you could use onions. You could use all of them actually. And also you might wanna put in some greens in there, you know, whatever your favorite green of the day is. Um, and I haven't tried it, I plan to try it, but probably not with ramps because it's long past the time of ramps. So in conclusion, uh, first, yes. Um, I just wanted to bring up that our participant, Sheila, um, mentioned that there is a ramps festival held in West Virginia. Oh, that would be fun to go to. I would like that. Um, so alliums. Alliums are great because on one end of the spectrum, you have these amazing looking flowers. Um, they're perennials. They're very easy care. They like rich, well-drained soil, full sun. They don't like wet feet, as I've mentioned numerous times. They're long bloomers. They go from May to July. They multiply naturally. They're staples of cuisine, and they're so easy to grow. So that wraps it up for me. Are there any other questions? 
Well, maybe while we're waiting for someone to send through a, a question, I'd like to thank you, Audrey, for the presentation. Your examples of the Orientals were beautiful and the descriptions and all the information about bulb formation and harvesting was, was very informative. And I just wanna let the participants know that Audrey mentioned handouts several times. They are available through the library's website at the registration page, or if you wanna to go to our YouTube channel, there's a link there to our handout. So maybe you wanna try some of the recipes too. Okay, and uh, Sheila says, thank you very much also. Claire does as well. That was great, Audrey. There are no Thank questions because I think you covered everything. <laughs> There's a lot more I didn't say. <laughs> okay, so um, I also wanted to mention that if you all wanted to view parts or her whole presentation again, or if you know someone that couldn't make it today, um, it is accessible through our website by clicking on the uh, virtual programs for adults link or going to our YouTube channel. And don't forget that the library has great resources for gardeners in its branches and through its digital library. Um, please join us for our next program in the series, Winter Seed Sowing. It'll be held on Saturday, November 13th, also at 11 o'clock. And just in time for winter, Master Gardener Connie Sorrell will demonstrate a low cost, easy, and fun way to germinate seeds by sowing outside under natural light and temperature to get a head start on flowers and cool season vegetables for spring planting. Um, are there any other questions? Well, thank you very much for joining us today and we look forward to seeing you on November 13th. Thanks everyone. Thank you, Audrey. Thanks so much. Thank you.